Seems like a weird way to start a phone review, but a bit about me. I've been in the phone reviews game for about 10 years, so I remember the very first Galaxy Note. In those days, Samsung's so-called phablet stood alone, purely because it was so massive. It actually seemed ridiculous at the time, but as phones got bigger, slowly catching up with the Galaxy Note, it seemed a bit more normal. But still, the big, square, stylus-equipped phone was a favourite among tech enthusiasts, at least until they started exploding randomly. Now, the Note is no more and hasn't been for a couple of years, but its spirit lives on in the S24 Ultra, still doing a few things to set it apart from the rest, and retaining that large rectangular design. I'm Cam Bunton from Pocketlint, and this is my review of this phone that's both the pinnacle of smartphone hardware and a little reminder of the Note series of the past. Now, there are a few ways in which the S24 Ultra sets itself apart from the competition, certainly in the Android world. And, spoiler alert, it's got nothing to do with Galaxy AI. Because this doesn't just stand alone compared with other brands, it stands in contrast against the rest of the S24 lineup. The right angled corners in the display and around the edges, combined with the completely flat top and bottom and skinny bezels, ensure its silhouette is very different from the friendly rounded phones. Similarly, the titanium frame around the edges offers a very different feel and texture to the aluminium framed alternatives. The easiest way to describe it, I think, is that it's warm. It doesn't have that slippery cold feel, and the matte finish doesn't reflect light in the same way as aluminium or steel. And it's almost contradictory that a phone packed with features in a very maximalist sort of way has a strikingly minimal design. It's thin, but it's pretty big, and there is a disadvantage to those right angled corners, they can dig into the palm a bit. So you may just have to find a new way to grip your phone to avoid discomfort if you're not used to it. But here's the thing though, to me at least, that big, square, awkward design is a little nostalgic tip of the hat to the fact that, despite the name, this is still, in spirit, a Galaxy Note. Of course, if that's the subtle hat tip, the big, bold, screaming in your face sign that this is still very much a Galaxy Note, in all but name, is the silo in the bottom edge storing the latest version of Samsung's S Pen. Pull it out of its nest with the screen locked and you can just scribble away, creating a quick note immediately without having to unlock your phone. Unlock your phone and you can do so much more. You can draw, highlight, scribble, circle items, mark up documents or even sign them. There's so much utility added to the phone just by having this S Pen and its dedicated software features that it's almost deserving of its own video. So if you want one, let me know in the comments. You can even use air gestures with the S Pen controlling the phone without touching the screen. In the camera app, for instance, you can take photos, switch between the camera modes, zoom in or out, all just by pressing the button and waving it around like a magic wand. Wingardium Leviosa and all that. Disappointingly, those classic Wizarding World spells don't work, but it does feel a little bit like magic at times. Holding on to that feeling that this phone does a bit extra showing that bit of spirit that set the Note series apart from all those years ago. It does take a little bit of time to get the gestures right, but once you've learned them, it's like second nature. Whether you'd use them regularly in the place of a much more energy efficient touch or swipe on the screen, well, that's the thing. It's a little additional extra, and it's handy for hands-free photos when you've got a tripod, but I can't say I used it for anything else all that often. Now we've got to this point with smartphone displays where from a purely technical standpoint it feels almost impossible to see how they'd improve. So many phones now have 120Hz refresh displays, even affordable phones. Many are bright, vibrant and HDR compatible too, so how do you make sure people know that this is a better display than the rest? Or at least make the experience better than the rest? Samsung's answer is to deal with something that doesn't typically get communicated or printed in a spec sheet, and that's screen reflections. Yes, it's still a staggeringly bright, fluid, sharp and beautiful big display, but what covers the surface is what makes this screen different. Because while peak brightness certainly helps with outdoor visibility and bright direct sunlight, or any bright lighting conditions, what matters just as much is reflection. And glass, as we know, is generally a very reflective material. But not this glass. Yes, it still reflects bright light, but it does so with very minimal glare. So instead of blowing out reflections across the screen, it keeps them contained. And that really helps with visibility when there's any bright source of light pointed at the screen. It's a bit of a game changer. With the screen off with light in the area, you can see that anti-reflective layer working. There's no refracting light or glare across the screen, so it looks darker and inkier black than any phone I've seen to date. Just another one of those things that adds the bit extra to the Ultra, setting it apart from its siblings and the competition. Oh, and part of that is that it's Gorilla Glass Armor, a version of Gorilla Glass that hasn't yet made its way to other phones. 
It's more durable and more scratch resistant than Victus, which is a good thing given the ease at which I seem to scratch those versions. Now I've mentioned Samsung's maximalist approach with features, and it's abundantly clear when looking at Samsung's One UI 6.1 software built on top of Android 14. A huge focus this year has been Galaxy AI, this idea that you can have AI understand text, voice or pictures and help you summarize notes and web pages, correct your spelling or even interpret speech so you can talk to someone who speaks a different language from you, even if you're on a phone call. Now some of these features are clearly copies of Google's efforts, like the generative fill in the gallery app or actually just Google services built directly into the software like the AI wallpaper or circle to search, which has now rolled out to pixels as well. You do also get handy gestures and other advanced features like swiping to split screen or launching a pop-up window for an app swiping across the screen to take a screenshot, or double pressing the side key to launch any app you like. I use it for music recognition. And there's a whole lot more to discover if you're interested. I've made a tips and tricks video which you can watch showing some of my favorites. I'll leave a link up there somewhere. Short version, just like always, there's a sense Samsung is throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, except now it's framing it afterwards and making it look pretty. But let's move on to cameras. Now being the ultra model means it gets the most impressive camera system of the S24 range. It's got four for some reason, offering both a three times optical and a five times optical periscope style zoom alongside the main and ultra wide lenses. In typical Samsung style, the results from those cameras are very Samsung-y. What I mean by that is that the blue skies and green grass in particular are pushed a bit far in terms of saturation, as is the contrast. So you end up with a sky that's unnaturally blue, more than you'd find on most other phones. The same with the green on the grass. And this is with the scene optimization feature switched off. It certainly gives pictures some pop, but photographers with aspirations of a cleaner, more muted color palette might be better served elsewhere. It does have the ability to lift light from the shadows in scenes where there was harsh direct sunlight. There's still a sense to me, however, that the default processing of the automatic camera cranks the contrast too high, which along with the saturation makes images look artificial and over sharpened. Now, what can I say about the zoom that hasn't been said in previous years already? It's essentially what sets the phone camera apart from the other S24s, giving you the flexibility to zoom in really quite far and get a sharp picture. Stick to below the 10 times mark and you'll get a decent sharp image without too many issues. When you zoom in more or crop into those photos, you'll see details of trees and branches are a bit rough. Particularly with bright highlights reflecting on them, they lose any sense of natural texture and it becomes more like a smoothed out oil painting the further that you zoom. I also had a couple of times where there was an issue with stabilization on the zoom lens, where motion and handshake blur crept in, especially in scenes where there wasn't a ton of bright light. Still, the camera system is an effective tool in nighttime scenes. Using it completely handheld, it automatically detects when there's not much light, keeps the shutter open longer, and uses algorithms to remove any shakiness from your hands. The result is bright, light-filled shots at nighttime. It's good enough with the primary camera that you can point it directly at the sky and get passable starry sky shots. Although it's probably better to use a tripod and manual mode for this, because motion blur can creep in. Now there's not a lot to note on performance and battery life, not because it's bad, but because it's the opposite. It's predictably very accomplished and it delivers speedy, fluid and smooth performance across the interface and loads even the most demanding apps without any trouble, thanks to the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 inside, plus that 12 gigabytes of RAM. And because it's the Ultra, it's Snapdragon in every market. Battery life is great too, although not quite as stellar as what OnePlus has managed with the OnePlus 12. Still with my own typical use, which is fairly light, I can get through almost two full days. Usually ending the first day with about 50% left over and having used it in the day to test the cameras, play games and read the web and get sucked into Instagram reels for a while. Total usage is around about three hours a day for me. You can charge it with up to 45 watt speeds too for a relatively quick full refill and you can use a wireless charger if you want to. Now in my time testing the S24 Ultra, I've had to regularly check myself, even while writing this script for this video, to not call this phone the Galaxy Note, because that Note spirit very much lives on. It's a big phone with a massive beautiful flat display, premium build materials and top tier performance. Sure, there are faster charging phones, and sure, I'd love less of the oversaturation in the photos and less of that artificial look from the processing, but as a complete package, it's really good. The additional software features add utility in some places, needless bloat in others. So as always with Samsung, a pros and cons list is needed to decide whether putting up with that is worth it to get the rest of it. And in my experience with the S24 Ultra, it absolutely is. 
Let me know what you think of the S24 Ultra in the comments down below, or you can grab me on threads. I'm at Cam Bunton. If you did like this video, please do leave a thumbs up, tap subscribe and that notification bell, and you'll be delivered fresh videos twice a week, usually on a Tuesday and a Friday, but sometimes on a Wednesday and a Friday, plus daily shorts. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you again in the next one. Bye for now.